the climate emergency is not that much of an emergency. We are making progress on carbon emissions reduction much faster than anybody predicted 20 years ago. But yeah, it, it's it, we're going to have some global warming, and we've already had some. But the RCP 8.5 scenario, where basically all the ice caps melt and New York and Miami become oceans, it's not going to happen. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. All right. Thanks, Niels. And hello, everyone. So if you've been in the investment business at some point over the last 40 years, or if you've just been interested in investment over that time horizon, there's a good chance you've read an article by our guest today, Larry Siegel. He's written over 300 articles since 1980. Now, my, my quant skills aren't, aren't what they used to be, but that works out to be an average of an article a month for over 40 years, which is um, truly phenomenal. So Larry is currently the director of research at CFA Institute Research Foundation. And he's also investment thought leader at Foundation Financial Officers Group, uh, as well as being on the uh, editorial board of the Journal of Investing and the Journal of Portfolio Manager uh, Portfolio Management. Um, so Larry, uh, it's a real honor to have you tonight. Thanks for joining us on Top Traders Unplugged. Well, thank you, Kevin. So we're here to talk about your book, Fewer, Richer, Greener, Prospects for Humanity in an Age of Abundance. And I have to admit, I was attracted to the book because of the title, because it's optimistic. Uh, when I read the book, the tone is optimistic. Uh, and the message ultimately is one of, of optimism. Um, but I wanted to tell you that we're operating a safe space here. So if at any point in time you want to say something pessimistic, uh, you should feel totally comfortable doing so. Well, um, let me caution that I wrote the book in 2019 when the world was at peace. Uh, we were at the tail end of a long economic boom. And things were frankly a little bit better than they are now. So it's hard to be as optimistic as I was then about the immediate or short-run future. But I, looking at the trends over centuries and de decades, even looking at the last couple of decades, just this century, uh, I'm very optimistic about continued economic growth all, of, all over the world or in most of the world, and also about the progress that we're making that's kind of unexpected in the environment. And th th honestly, that's what one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is that you're not making predictions about what's going to happen 12 months out, 24 months out. No one can really do that with any accuracy. Um, you're looking at the data and you're drawing longer run conclusions. And we all are going to have to live in the world that you're you're talking about. Um, I, I was curious. I wanted to just ask you a kind of personal question to start off with. Are you an optimist by nature, or is is your optimism kind of like data driven? Do you do you look at the data and then decide, you know, 
to be optimistic or pessimistic? Well, my, my ground philosophy or personal point of view is a mixture of the idea of human progress over time and the tragic vision that was identified by the ancient Greeks and then the Romans and so on through the medieval times to the present. So I can see both sides of almost any question. I have to start off by asking a question on process. So my wa- my wife is uh, working on a novel, and she listens to a lot of interviews with authors. And she's uh, she says she's more interested in hearing about their process of writing than the than the content. Um, so she's like. Make sure you ask Larry about his process. So I'm going to ask you about your process. We're actually recording this at midnight or a little past midnight now, Chicago time, which is where you're based. So I'm curious, are you a night owl? Um, do you write yeah, better at I, night? I write better at night. I like to do other things during the day. Then my mind and my body settle down and I can focus better on uh, my thoughts. And I also don't have as many distractions. Uh, I have gotten past the point in life where I have kids running around. They're, one of them is in his 40s, another in her 30s. Uh, I am married, so they're, they're, that's a distraction that I very much welcome. But basically at this time of night, I, I, I will do my best work. And have you always worked that way? Are all, all 300 articles written at, uh, at midnight when everything else is quiet? Well, when I had an actual job, I mean, I worked for the Ford Foundation, which has an office and a building and a set of rules for 15 years. And before that, at Ibbotson Associates, which is now part of Morningstar, I, I did a lot of work during the day, but I didn't really prefer to. I'm, I'm a musician, too. And, oh. and when I was starting my career, I, I was a semi-professional musician. So if you're going to go to gigs and then you have to hang around to get paid. And the whole point of it is to meet girls, right? And so you're going to sometimes get to bed at three o'clock in the morning. You go, you, you tend to move toward a later shift and that's persisted with me. So let's talk now about the, um, about the book. So the title is Fewer, Richer, Greener. And you go into a, quite a lot of detail on the history and the future of demographics, wealth, environmentalism. People can and have written books on each of these themes separately. Why did you choose to, you know, kind of link all three together? Well, they're already linked together. I just wanted to do two things. One is to write about what I was reading. It's a book about books as mm-hmm. well as about the topic. I, I talk about Matt Ridley and his economic history, which leads him to have a, an optimistic bias about the future. Steven Pinker, who has written extensively about the Enlightenment and how the Enlightenment in Europe and to some extent the Americas 250 or 300 years ago led to a takeoff in economic growth that never stopped. Before that, there was economic growth, but then it would stop and go the wrong way. And there's certainly some evidence that the average person in the world didn't live much better in 1750 than they did in 750. Some things were better, but not necessarily the number of calories. The number of hours worked was very high. Uh, lifespans were 30 or 40 years, although that includes a lot of infant mortality. A lot of people live to an older age than that. But they also did in 750. And a- after the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the spread of democracy and the spread of capitalism, everything began to take off in an upward direction that, that has never really stopped and started in Northwestern Europe and the United States. After 50 or 75 years ago, it started to catch on in the rest of the world in a way that has brought China into the economic, uh, um, into the first world in a sense. Not quite, but sort of. India is making tremendous progress, but way behind China, obviously way behind Europe and the, and the U.S. And uh, 
it's the democratization of wealth and uh, opportunity that that impresses me the most. It, it it didn't just stay in the Netherlands and the north of England and and New England in the U.S. It it, it became a virus that took over the world. Only communism, fascism have been able to stop it. And I want them to go away and stay away. <laughs> yeah, and I think we, we all had thought they, uh, or at least fascism, had been kind of vanquished or nearly vanquished. Um, I, I thought communism was too. China isn't really communist. Vietnam isn't really communist. North Korea and Cuba are, but they're tiny. And eventually they'll be absorbed into the world economy. Cuba first. I, I want to spend the majority of the conversation on the kind of the last third of the book, the greener portion, just because I feel like this is the area where we kind of need the optimistic perspective the most. But let's kind of work our way there and um, start with the, the fewer section. Um, we actually did a podcast last week with um, Manoj Pradhan, who wrote uh, The Great Demographic Reversal with Charles Goodhart. You know, so their book is is all about demography, and the, really their focus is on kind of how the demographic trends are going to uh, influence inflation, create higher inflation. Um, that's not really a big part of your review of demography. When when you look at kind of population trends over the long perspective, which is what you do in the first third of the book, what what is it that you want people to take out of it? What are the messages that that you think really ought to be absorbed? Well, the population explosion that we all grew up with as being the end of the world is over. Even in Africa, which may continue growing for the better part of a century, and it may get to 4 billion, I don't think so, but mm -hmm. it'll get to 3 billion. Population is growing at a decelerating rate. In other words, it's continuing to grow, but more slowly. And the, second derivative has gone negative. So it's more slowly each year than it was the previous year. And that has already happened in Asia. We already know about Europe, North America, and and Latin America actually just as, just uh, population growth is just as much under control as it is anywhere else. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, and to some extent, but not a very large extent, that the Islamic Middle East, the population growth is a little higher, Africa a lot higher, but coming down. So this emergency has now gone away. The panic button, though, has been pushed. And I forget what Charles Goodhart said and his his co-author, whose name I always mispronounce, so I won't try. But but I think they're concerned about popula a population implosion. And that you're, it's a demographic reversal, right? So we won't have Correct. enough young people to support the old ones. And frankly, a world full of old people is a little bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they have my, my technology skills. Um, well, I think what they were saying, their, their book is much more narrowly focused um, in the sense of it's really on, you know, I, I don't want to, I shouldn't say it's narrowly focused, it's more narrowly focused than yours. And they're, they're basically saying that the dependency ratio, kind of the ratio of, you know, inflationary older retired people versus deflationary workers is going to increase. And that's going to put upward pressure on inflation, mainly because there's going to be, um, you know, a shortage of, of labor. And so wage rates are, are, are going to go up. So that's, you know, in a, in a nutshell, um, a lot of what they're talking about in the book. Yeah, I actually reviewed their book for Advisor Perspectives, and you can find the review on my website, but I don't remember exactly what I said. It was a while back. I, I believe that that's a valid concern, but inflation is mostly a monetary and fiscal phenomenon. Uh, the money supply is controlled by various governments, and fiscal policy is controlled entirely by governments. So if relative prices change, let's say care workers who help old people do whatever needs to be done, that means they'll get more expensive and something else will get less expensive in real terms. 
because there's only so there, there are only so many dollars to go around if the money supply is stable. Now, if governments increase the money supply in an attempt to make this phenomenon easier for everybody, that's going to backfire because prices will rise and it won't be easier for everybody. We saw it in the <laughs> right. 70s, and we're seeing it again now. But I think that Charles Goodhart is usually right. His, his thesis that old people have to have production in current time in order to have their needs met is correct. You, you can't just right. save a lot of money and have everything you want because if everybody saved enough money to have everything they want, there would be really nothing for them to buy. The prices would skyrocket and they'd be back where they start. So that is the idea that inflation is a problem uh, is, has come back uh, really with a vengeance and inflation is a tax on savers. Your savings are suddenly worth much less, but your labor probably isn't worth much less. And so it's a transfer of wealth from older savers to everybody else. And as a about to become 68 year old, I don't like it. <laughs> However, I am still working. Yeah. And I think part of what they're also saying is that, you know, ideally, Governments would have to run tighter fiscal policies. That taxes would have to go up uh, to finance some of that. They think that's unlikely. Therefore, there'll be you know essentially governments issuing debt, which the central bank will will have to finance, and that that will also add inflationary pressure. Um, but I don't want to get into a big kind of fiscal monetary policy discussion here because well, that's let not me just really one sentence. But please go ahead. Yeah, at one percent, that's fine. <laughs> at fifteen percent. It's a catastrophe, and where we're going is you're somewhere talking about, in uh, you talking about inflation. The amount of no, the amount of government debt at a fifteen percent inflation rate, which means a fifteen percent interest rate, governments simply right. cannot pay their the service on their debt. So that so they won't, and there'll be defaults all over the world. So they won't allow it to happen. So we will get higher taxes. We will get fewer government services. The budget has to balance but it doesn't have to balance in the same place every time. You can only take money away from savers for so long before, as Margaret Thatcher said, you run out of other people's money. So are you kind of in general agreement that the the demographic trends are inflationary long-term, or you're, you don't sound as convinced as they are? <laughs> I'm not convinced. There's a risk that governments will play this game in a way, such a way as to think they're solving the problem by having inflation, which mm -hmm. does nothing but impose a tax on savers to subsidize borrowers. And it never ends well. And if that's what governments around the world do, then they're right. This is not going to be good. But there are other ways to, to manage the problem. But fiscal responsibility would be the Two word answer. <laughs> well, let's hope we get we get some of that. Um, I, I want to talk about a couple of interesting things that you point out. Um, and you mentioned that you know the kind of scare story about population growth is is not going to turn out to be true. And you actually mentioned a, a kind of, a, I guess, a fact let that I hadn't really fully appreciated about India, where you said, you know, actually the, the birth rate in over half the states there is below replacement rate. It's changed since I wrote it. Now the birth rate for the whole country on average is below replacement rate. When I wrote it, it was 2.5 or something. Now it's 2.0. So... It may have been over half the states, but they don't all have the same population. The, the biggest right. states, like Bihar, ha, it's come down so fast that now the average for the country is below replacement rate. That's, that's truly astonishing. Sure What's is. happening there? Is it the same story in India as we've seen played out in other countries? Well, there are really two factors. One is economic incentives built into the structure of society. You're better off having fewer children these days because you have to educate them, feed them, clothe them, 
and after you send them off to the city to earn a living, they don't even call you. <laughs> Whereas they used to work for you for free and then support you in your old age. So the, the economic incentives to have a lot of children have gone away, not in all the little villages in India, but obviously more so than not. And then the other thing that's happened is the spread of, of contraceptive technology to mm -hmm. people who either didn't have access to it or didn't want to use it. So they're, they're obviously using it. So the, the, the falling birth rate in India is something that, is that something that people actually predicted would fall as fast as it did? Nope. The UN Population Division forecasts were for a much slower decline in the birth rate. And they've had to update the forecast many times to reflect that they expect population stabilization to take place sooner and sooner and sooner. They did revise huh. it the other direction once, but they were talking about sub-Saharan Africa, where I think they thought it was going to follow the Asian pa pattern more quickly than it has. But, but Asia really has become fantastically rich relative to its own history, and, and Africa hasn't. Let, let's talk about Africa then. So... Do you see a prospect of economic growth leading to a kind of quicker than than expected fall in, in the birth rate there, or is it too too difficult to really make that kind of prognosis? No, we're seeing it already. I, I have a chart in my book, which I obviously can't show you over the uh, in an audio recording, which shows the Asia curve and then the Africa curve. I think mm -hmm. it also shows Europe and some other places. The A Africa curve is in the right direction, and it looks like the Asia curve did until about 1980 or 1990. Then Asia just, the birth rate just plunged. That has not happened in Africa. Will it? Africa has a lot of bad governments. I don't think there's anything different about African people, but because of the relationship between leaders and the electorate. The democracies have not functioned particularly well there. You might blame colonialism. I, I, there's a little evidence that that may be true because the, Brit the former British colonies have done much better than the former French, Belgian, German, Italian, and so forth colonies. And we know that the British were, were more effective administrators of colonies. So... I'm pretty optimistic, but I, I want to check back in 75 years <laughs> and, and see if Africa in 2100 looks like Asia did in 1980. And if it does, we're fine, because Asia was starting, starting to be a pretty nice place in 1980. I will, uh, I'll talk to Niels about scheduling you for that. Um for that follow-up podcast in 75 years. Um, it, it's interesting, though, you you also make a kind of a, a more just sort of general point about African population growth where you say, hey, you know, that's where the bulk of global population growth is going to be. And you've got this, you know, huge center of, of population growth of, you know, and if you can generate some economic growth, the combination of, you know, genetic diversity and growing wealth could mean that, you know, in 50 years, the, you know, majority of the world's scientists and artists are, are African. I'm going to ask for 120 years. Deidre McCloskey okay. is older than me. And she's the person that <laughs> pointed it out. And she's right. Eventually, when you have a, con a you know, a, a rich, growing continent full of young, ambitious people who are absorbing influences from everybody in the world. That there, there are some advantages to being a follower rather than a leader. Eventually, half of the accomplished people in the world will be African. But the amount of accomplishment in, in every field, whether it's the sciences, the arts, technology, that's taking place in Asia right now is so huge that it's a it's a high bar, and it's just the way Europe and North America was a high bar in 1950. And 
these things move slower than you think they're going to until they start to move fast and then it happens all at once. And all of a sudden, everybody comes out with a book on it. <laughs> so it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of a cool sort of, you know, given that civilization started in Africa, that, uh, you know, things will eventually come full circle and, and um, you know, our our scientific and artistic future resides um, ultimately in Africa. Um, By the way, I... I, I I need to walk back something I just said a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. By 1980, China had not made the uh, capitalist transformation that it had made by the 1990s. So I would say that by the 1990s, I'm not sure when in the 1990s, it was obvious that China would become prosperous and essentially middle class. India had went through its transformation around 1993. So it's a little more recent than I was suggesting for Asia. I actually remember when I was working at Barclays in London, this was actually right around the early 1990s, and they introduced a, a fund, an India-dedicated fund with the pitch that, you know, it was going to have the biggest middle class of any country in the world. And they were a bit early on that, but in the end, um, the thesis was right. I think that's right, it, it, or it will be tied with China, but they'll have more freedom and, unless something happens in politics in China that we don't expect, and freedom means a lot. Um, when I look at the Indian people in our field, in finance, also in technology, mm -hmm. they're like Jews in the 1950s. They just run everything, and they run it better than anybody <laughs> else by such a large margin, there's no comparison. <laughs> Sorry if I offended anybody. They, you know, a lot of my students come from India and they're just, you know, incredibly, not, not only incredibly uh, well trained technically, but they bring a, an enthusiasm and an energy that, um, that, that, that really just kind of blows my mind every year when I, when I see it. I know. But where do you teach, by the way? <laughs> I teach at, at Berkeley at Haas Business School. Oh, wonderful. And I, I, I teach a, a graduate class in financial engineering. So actually about, uh, I'd say about half the students are Chinese and a third Indian and mm -hmm. then a smattering of, of you know, Europeans. Um, Larry, you mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago about the importance of, of freedom. And what's your what's your view? Do you think... There will be more more freedom, more I don't know li liberty in in China over time. I think so. I first of all, the amount of liberty in China has increased almost monotonically, straight up, from uh, nineteen seventy six ish to a couple of years ago, a and the output of Chinese academics in the sciences and technology is the equal of anybody in the world. In finance, it's really not. They haven't had right. a financial system to study. And there's a language barrier. It's hard to read the stuff they write. But, but in, you know, science is a more of a universal language. So they've had the freedom to produce pretty much what they want. And in terms of the ordinary people, you know, it's in my book, Johann Norberg, who's a Pretty popular author. He's a Scandinavian, uh, obviously, student of social and economic trends who said basically being unfree, and he calls China unfree, mm -hmm. isn't what it used to be. You can get a job. You can quit your job. You can move. You can marry whom you want, including someone of the same sex. Nobody's going to have anything to say about it. You can almost publish anything you want. What you cannot do is criticize the government. You can do almost literally everything else. So this is a different world than the China of, of Mao Zedong, 1976. He still thinks it's unfree, so I still think it's unfree because he spent a good chunk of his life there and I've spent two and a half weeks. But, <laughs> but what I, what, one thing I could do when I was there was wander around by myself, not tell anybody where I was going, and it, I was afraid that I would be subject to a police state type of surveillance as a tourist. If I was, I never knew it. 
Yeah, no, I, I had a similar experience. I was there in 2018. I taught a two-week course uh, in Qingdao in the north. And it was funny because I... Um, yeah, I went out to a to caf to a cafe, and basically, um, I was able to via my phone get into the New York Times and read a series that they had produced on how China had walled off the internet. <laughs> so I, I was sitting in China reading about how you can't get on the internet in China, and and what I kind of took away from that was that, you know, a kind of educated five, maybe 10% of the population can sort of do it at once. They all have access to VPNs. And I think as long as, you know, that that doesn't spread to the, the masses, I, th- I, I think the, the they allow a certain amount of, of you know, almost complete freedom of information. I, I think that's right. But I, I don't think that you have a free society until you get past five or 10% by a, by a lot. In, right. in the United States, it it feels to me like 60% of the people are somewhat well-informed. When they go to the voting booth, they don't act like they're somewhat well-informed. But if you if you just sit and talk to them, they seem, you sit, talk to people in small towns across the Midwest, the South, and so forth, our working class isn't composed of idiots. And I, I think in China, you'd find the same thing. They're pretty well informed, but there's some things they haven't been exposed to yet, but will be. Let's pivot a little bit and move on just to talk about the richer segment of the book. And I want to, you know, as as I said, there's there's kind of so much in this book, it's impossible for me to to get at all of it. But I want to ask about a quote or a comment you have where you say basically the history of economic growth is in large part the history of achieving better and cheaper sources of energy. And I, I like that because obviously it links to the last part of the book on greener, but can you just explain what you mean by that? Well, energy is kind of the master resource. That's a phrase that Julian Simon used 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Uh, he, he's long since passed on when he was explaining how he thought the economy worked. Mm -hmm. Basically, what people did for a living for all of human history is, first of all, to look for food, which is a search for energy. We now, in the United States, spend 6 or 7% of GDP on food. Europe, it's a little more. But uh, it leaves a lot of money for other things. So that search for energy has become radically cheaper in terms of the amount of effort that you have to expend in order to uh, to get what you need and then do do what you feel like with the, with the rest of your time what i've studied most carefully is lighting mm-hmm. that it took something like 50 hours of labor for an ancient babylonian to get 1 hour of illumination for reading a book. I think they had scrolls, but for the equivalent of a book. By, by Shakespeare's time, it was down to a few hours. And when Tom, Thomas Edison, of course, made the biggest difference because, but, but, not, but not in the securing of energy, but in the efficient use of energy, the light bulb was something like a thousand times as energy efficient for per output of light as the carbon arc lamp, which had existed for most of the 19th century, which was many, many times more efficient than candles and, and that sort of thing. So now it takes just a few seconds of labor for an hour, for an hour's lighting. And an hour's lighting is worth, you know, 15 cents or something like that. So if the national average wage is $30 an hour, which is roughly what it is. You can do the math. It takes uh, almost no effort to get those kilowatts. So that's ec- that's what economic growth is. Now, there are other things you want besides energy. This computer is more powerful than all the computers in the world added together in 1950. And I think there were five of them. Uh, my phone 
has more computing power than the than than existed in 1980 in the space program. So computing power isn't energy, it's something else. It, it's become radically cheaper so quickly that you kind of forget what life was like before that change. Right. For example, to have this conversation, I, I don't have to get on an airplane and fly to Switzerland. <laughs> and uh, I don't have to run up a long distance bill of five or $600, which is how I would have had the conversation 50 years ago. And uh, we're doing it, I think, almost for free. I, I'm not getting a bill. Uh, I'm just uh, only for the electricity that my computer uses. That, that's what economic growth is. We, we think of it in terms of increasing GDP per capita, but, but it's really things you want getting cheaper and cheaper to the point where there are other things you didn't even know you wanted, <laughs> and those are getting cheaper. <laughs> you talk about Vaclav Smil a fair amount. Um, could you explain... I know he's one of Bill Gates' favorite author, and I, I've read a little bit about him. Um, could you tell the listeners who might not know who he is, who he is, and why he's important? Vaclav Smil is a professor of Czech origin who lives and works in Canada. He's an old guy, probably pushing eighty, and he writes about two six hundred page books a year on energy. <laughs> he's a it's a tough read. He's very technical. But he has he brings together in his work all the research that other people are doing. Obviously, it's not all all his on uh, progress or the lack of it in energy production, energy transitions, such as from fossil fuels to something else. Uh, he has made the point that energy transitions take a long time. the The wave seems to be about a sixty year wave wood to coal, coal to oil, oil to natural gas, now fossil fuels to renewables slash nuclear. Nuclear is easier because we already have it, but it's harder because people hate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when push comes to shove, you know, when the lights start to go out or the, their electricity bill turns out to be bigger than their income, they're going to support nuclear. The French have the best system, which is small, identical nuclear reactors all over the place, selling and producing locally, with the main advantage being interchangeable parts, like every other manufacturing process in the world, except for power plants. And so that the, uh, the crew that runs them and fixes them, supports them, it can well, if they're trained in one place, their training is good everywhere else. It's what I call the Southwest Airlines system. They have one kind of plane, so they only have to hire one kind of pilot, and that pilot can fly every plane in the airline. I'm not sure the Southwest analogy is going to bring a lot of comfort for those who <laughs> worry about nuclear power, but I, I take the point. Well, let's talk about nuclear power because you basically say in the greener section that really there's four things we can do that have – a big environmental impact. There's urbanization, moving people to cities. There's nuclear power. There's genetic engineering, and there's ecosystem engineering. And I, time permitting, I want to ask you about certainly about those last three. But let's talk about nuclear power. And here's here's my perspective. Now, this is coming from someone who grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I was mm -hmm. living there um, in 1979, and you know we were taken out of class and everyone, almost everyone, but my family, uh, evacuated. My dad was one of these guys who never, who always thought the meteor was exaggerating. So we stayed in town and I showed up for baseball practice and I came back and like, dad, there's no one here. Maybe it's more serious than, <laughs> than you think. But, um, it's not really my experience so much growing up in Harrisburg that makes me worried about nuclear power. It's, I feel like to use a financial markets analogy, there's tail risk. And the tail risk is is difficult to evaluate and and price. And I don't I, I listened to this podcast called Hidden Forces. Uh, they had a good show about a year ago about the solar winds hack. And I just remember listening to that and thinking, if that ever happened at a nuclear plant, 
then all of a sudden you've got a source of energy that's turned into a potential weapon. weapon now, maybe yeah. that's not possible. I don't know. But how, how do you react to something like that? There is tail risk. The materials used to power a nuclear plant can be further refined to weapons grade. You have to really be good, a good nuclear engineer to do this and have a billion dollars worth of equipment. But there are, there are state and non-state actors in the world who conceivably could, but they're not going to do it that way. They're just going to build a nuclear weapon without running it through a nuclear power plant first. And there are some pretty bad guys who have nuclear weapons already. Mm-hmm. But the real tail risk is more like Fukushima or Chernobyl. Uh, Fukushima, the, the tail risk is that you put a nuclear plant on a, on a seismic zone, in a seismic zone, <laughs> and then have a tsunami. This Something like this will happen again. Is it a true human catastrophe? We don't know the extent of the damage. But the public imagination is thousands or hundreds of thousands of people were killed, displaced from their homes, and so forth. Obviously, thousands were displaced from their homes and not coming back for many years. You're talking about Chernobyl. No, Fukushima. Fukushima. Yeah, Fukushima, I believe one person was killed. And then a number of old people were died because of the way in which they were moved out of harm's way. So those are casualties too. Right. But so you don't see the risk that I just talked about of a you know a state actor, let's say Russia, hacking into a, a nuclear plant and as a risk. You don't think that's something that should prevent us from that pursuing? It is a risk but that the consequences are not that severe. Nuclear plants are not built in such a way that they can be turned into thermonuclear weapons. The the worst thing that can happen is they can melt down and they just don't build them that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Chernobyl was built that way for two reasons. One is that was the technology available in the Soviet Union at the time. And two, that... Soviets didn't care enough to update the technology to something safer by 1986. They just let they, they they just let nature take its course, and it was terrible. But but Fukushima is a much better example because it's in a first world country. It was the worst possible that I can imagine combination of of circumstances, and yet one person was killed with the concern that a few thousand might die sooner because they had to be moved out of the way quickly because of radiation, because of something. Now, in the United States alone, coal mining has taken 11,000 lives since 1900. Nobody talks about that. It's just normal. You go into a coal mine, you might die. Oil is not as dangerous until you put the oil on trucks and start driving the trucks around. Then the trucks get in and crashes, the oil catches on fire, I don't know how many people have died in the oil industry since 1900. I think it's less than 11,000, but it's a bunch. None of these are anywhere close to the record of safety of the nuclear industry. So, yes, there's tail risk. We have to manage that risk better. There are incentives in countries like the United States to do that, such as insurance rates and regulation by the Nuclear Regulatory Authority whatever it's called this year, in, in a country with, with no freedom, let's say North Korea, you could conceivably build a, a nuclear plant that is so dangerous that a lot of people get killed and nobody in the government cares. It, it's not going to destroy the world. It's terrible for the people who are affected. But so is a coal mining disaster. Right. If nuclear energy, you know, if we decided, hey, this is actually has to be kind of front and center of our clean energy strategy, how quickly can it make a difference, let's say, in the U.S.? Probably 20 years. Uh, The U.S. has a lot of red tape that can be eliminated by a government that's bound and determined to get it done. Mm -hmm. Uh, In 19... 
60 or 61, John F. Kennedy said we're going to the moon by the end of the decade. That was the most ridiculous <laughs> claim that I've ever heard any politician make. The moon has been up there, and we've been down here for a long time, and all we had ever done at that point was to shoot rockets into what we called space, meaning 100 miles, not 250,000 miles, and we, there were no people on the rockets. So when they came crashing back down to Earth, we just made sure they landed in the ocean. Yet, in 1969, eight or nine years after that, two men walked on the moon. This was 66 years after the first people flew, Wright brothers, flew a little airplane a very short distance in North Carolina. 66 years is a microsecond in human history. If we wanted to get it done, it, it's not that hard. But you have to change, you have to get the real estate, you have to get the materials, you have to train the people, you have to get the regulatory and legal structures changed so that it begins to generate power. First thing, don't turn off the Diablo Canyon reactor. It's working <laughs> fine. They don't have any other source of power for when wind and solar don't produce anything other than to buy it from states that, are, that, that have nuclear reactors to sell the power to yeah. California. Right. So, yeah. yeah right. California is a, uh, is a maddening place um, in a lot of ways. Um, I, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, before I go, talk about genetic engineering and ecosystem engineering, your list of four things that we can do to have a big environmental impact didn't include carbon pricing. And I'm curious as to why. You're an economist. You've studied economics. Pricing matters. Why did you not have that on the list? I kind of took it for granted. There's nothing interesting to say about it. You took it for granted in what sense? That it's just going to happen? Everybody knows about it. It may not happen. But it's not a new technology that has to be developed over a period of time to put in place. I can buy and I can trade carbon credits right now, even though it's a holiday here. Uh, using uh, Richard Sanders' technology, he wrote a he wrote a book on it for the CFA Research Foundation about ten years ago. It's a tough sell to people who depend for their livelihoods on cheap transportation. Right. A lot of people live fifty miles from their jobs and make seventeen dollars and ninety three cents an hour. Though they will simply not be able to get to work. At today's carbon prices, they without the uh, tax, there's some taxes already. But, so it will require a certain amount of restructuring of the geography of our industrial life, which we should have done anyway. Makes no sense for people to live 50 miles from their jobs. And I think that, yeah, that's your point about urbanization and cities actually being, being green. Um, genetic engineering, this suggestion really appealed to me because uh as my my wife and kids will tell you I, any kind of like fad diet out there i i've tried so i i was on the paleo diet way before it was popular and um one thing i i remember reading about while i was on it is like the scientist had written this paper it's like hey there's nothing you can eat now that would have been available to cavemen right any food we have today has been modified, genetically engineered in such a way that it just didn't exist, you know, 20,000 years ago. And I, I think you make that, that point about, about corn in your book, that the corn we have today is, you know, looks nothing like its ancestral beginning. So genetic engineering, I think, is something that it sounds scary to, to people, but really we, we've already adapted and we're living with it. In what ways can genetic engineering, in your view, make the most difference in terms of climate change? Is it modifying trees to suck up more carbon? Is it feeding cows seaweed to reduce methane? Where, where, where do you think the biggest kind of bang for the buck is in genetic engineering? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Vaclav Smil knows, and 
I can read his book and, and write about it. But my main point about genetic engineering was in agriculture and medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have just begun to scratch the surface of the application of genetic engineering to medicine. The, the coronavirus vaccine is genetically engineered. They've been working on mRNA, messenger RNA vaccines for about 20 years, but we didn't need any. Mm -hmm. The thing is, when we did need one, we were able to produce one in a few months, three or four months, from discovering what the virus was that was causing the disease. It wasn't released for a while because you had to go through clinical trials to see if it was safe and effective. But we had the, we had the mRNA vaccine by early summer, late spring, early summer 2020. And you know how long it took to develop a vaccine for smallpox? The ancient Chinese were working on it in the 10th century. We finally got one that worked in the 18th century. That's a long wait. Didn't wipe out smallpox because of access to the vaccine until the late middle to late 20th century. We can't really wipe out COVID because unlike smallpox, it has reservoirs in animals where it produces new variants. And, but it's become so much milder so quickly, partly because of the vaccines, but because people aren't catching the worst kind and passing it on, that it's going to, it, it already is essentially endemic. Charity Dean may argue with me on that, but I don't think so. I think she's with me on that. I wrote an article on my website about, about that, that process. And, and the next disease is going to be much easier because we know everything we did wrong with COVID. So it just looping back though, because it's li you list genetic engineering as one of the biggest things we can do for the environment. And that's and agriculture. We, okay. So that, yeah, that, that's, that's using less land, less fertilizer, fewer pesticides, less sunshine. You probably turn Northern Russia into a, agricultural region, northern Canada, through growing crops that have been custom designed by us to thrive in those environments. We've already done it through cross hybridization and back crossing all these kind of mid mid scale technologies. They're not primitive. They're not advanced in the sense of manipulating the genes directly using CRISPR Cas9. They're technologies that were based in the discoveries of the 19th century, Mandel, Darwin and Mandel. And we've produced you know, increases in wheat yields, corn yields, soybean yields that are so huge that the main concern in most countries has gone from famine to obesity. And very quickly, in less than a century or about a century. Is this going to continue? Uh, yeah, I, I think it will actually accelerate. We have not reached peak food, but we're about to reach peak population. This is a good thing. There was just an article in Bloomberg the other day on seawater rice, where the Chinese have developed a way to basically grow rice in um, in water that's you know basically salty and alkaline, and you know that this potential to uh, to make China much more self-sufficient um, in food, and which in turn improves global f food security. So, right, um, no, it does. Yeah. And that was just you know something that's um, you know that I just happened to take note of because I knew I was going to talk to you uh, today. Let Let me ask you about your last um, point: ecosystem engineering. This is where you talk about some of the the more science fictiony ideas. Uh, including, I think, and I, there was one idea, and I don't, I don't think you put a whole lot of credence on it, but the uh, kind of basically putting a giant shield in space to block out some of the sun. If you if you had to bet on one of these crazy ideas taking hold, wh which one would it would it be? It will not be putting sunglasses on the Earth. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you to put a trillion little reflectors each one with an internet address, address and, and some kind of a solar-powered motor, and one error in the software code, and the thing plots out the sun. 
<laughs> for, for 300 years. I, 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 Bill Gates has written about it. Um, Al Gore spoke about it favorably. Um, it, I don't think it's going to happen. The climate emergency is not that much of an emergency. We are making progress on carbon emissions reduction much faster than anybody predicted 20 years ago. 40 years ago, we didn't know it was a problem. We thought global cooling might be a problem, which is worse. Where I live in Chicago, uh, it was under two miles of ice. It's hard to live under two miles of ice. But yeah, it, it's it, we're gonna we're gonna have some global warming, and we've already had some. But but the the RCP eight point five scenario, where basically all the ice caps melt, and New York and 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 Miami become o oceans, it's not going to happen. And it's partly not going to happen because of our response to the concern. Partly also, I believe, because the concern was overstated. We were using a one in, you know, 10 to the N. I don't know how big N is. Worst case scenario is though it was the expected scenario. You may want to do that. That isn't a bad idea for certain kinds of planning and analysis. You know, what happens if the world comes to an end tomorrow? But but it, it scared people into two things. One, which is good, which is supporting the action needed to uh, mitigate climate change. The other is terrible, which is basically to teach our children that they're all going to die. I ran into a lot of people, parents and children and teachers. And I actually want to write a book for young people about this who believe that they are the last generation of people on earth and that they won't make it very far into their lives. Uh, you know, Jason's why, right? Yes, I do. Yes. We, all, all of us investment types know and love the Wall Street Journal columnist Jason Zweig, who is probably the wisest uh, newspaper columnist on investing that, that ever lived, he, he had a young person, young woman, very bright, college graduate, ask him, uh, you know, why, why should I take your advice of investing for retirement? Funds I'm not going to be allowed to touch. You say they're going to grow to a lot of money in 40 or 50 years. When the world, when the earth is going to be a rotating cinder. <laughs> well, <laughs> so Jason called me and we had a nice discussion. He wrote it up and it was a, it was a fun piece. The earth is not going to be a rotating cinder. Minneapolis may have the climate of Kansas City and Kansas City may have the climate of Atlanta, but that's not a catastrophe. It's a change we can adapt to. And yes, if you are in the Maldives, or Nauru, or some other place where the average altitude is eight feet, you may have a problem. The ocean isn't going to rise eight feet, but in the worst storm of the year, you're going to get wet. And the, the ocean has been rising at about a foot every century and a half. Let's triple it. Three feet every century and a half. Can we plan ahead well enough to deal with that? The dikes around Amsterdam have been there since some since the 12th century, but they've been in good shape since the 15th century. Yes, there have been accidents. There was a bad flood only 70 years ago, but but, but we we know how to avoid that now. The dikes around Dhaka, Bangladesh, that haven't been built, and the dikes possibly around Saigon. I'm, I think it's a little far. I think the problem in Vietnam is a little farther south, but I'm not sure. They will be as much a part of our natural built environment, of what we understand to build our, to be our built environment, as the dikes in the Netherlands are today. It's expensive, but it's worth it. And that mitigation has been oversold. We should do it. But adaptation has been undersold. We need to be putting a lot of energy and thought and effort into figuring out how to have the damage from potentially catastrophic anthropogenic global warming be as, as non-catastrophic as possible. And I don't think it's reflectors in space. 
I think it's dikes around ba- Dacha. I think that that thing in the Thames, the, the, the Thames barrier, the Thames barrier, that's the word I'm looking for. It's going to get bigger and it's going <laughs> to, it may get closer to, to, to the ocean because uh, it, it's going to, you're going to need more than one barrier, but this isn't impossible. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the, the thoughtful optimism, the data driven optimism. And I, and I totally agree. That's a message that, that we have to get out there more wildly. So Larry, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to come and share your thoughts on really kind of just a phenomenal range of topics. It's been great chatting to you. And well, it's my uh, pleasure. You know, Thank you for having me. May I mention that my book, Fewer, Richer, Greener, absolutely, and my second book, Unknown Knowns, are available on Amazon. And all you need to do is type in the title because the first title, Fewer, Richer, Greener, is is unusual, and you, the book will just come up. If you want to read all of my articles through the last ten or fifteen years that that Kevin was so excited about, it, type in Unknown Knowns and then the word Folly because that's in the subtitle. And I love to talk about folly. I like to make fun of people who are doing stupid things. So that's my commercial. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Well, that's that's great. We're we're happy to have you. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Niels. Thank you so much, Kevin and Larry, for a very astute conversation on such a broad range of topics. Fewer, richer, greener touches on some of the most important topics that we are facing right now and having a good understanding of both the history of demographics, wealth, and the environment, as well as a view of where we're heading, is vital, not least for us as investors, let alone us as humans. I like that there was a sense of optimism in what Larry shared, even if some people may not share his view that the climate emergency is not so much an emergency. But let's face it, There are a lot of unknowns in any of these predictions, so we should leave room for some disagreements along the way. The demographic changes in places like India and Africa were quite eye-opening, and the comment that Larry made about half of the world's accomplished people at some point will be African is also something that nobody talks about. Make sure you go and follow Larry and Kevin's work, as well as getting a copy of their books, because as you can tell from today's conversation, Some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.